Well, welcome. Thank you all for coming to this next installment of Coffee with Jim. I'm here with co Coach Lorenzo Romar, the Pepperdine men's basketball head coach, uh, who has, is now uh, finished, he's finished up his second season uh, with Pepperdine, and we're looking forward to the third season this coming spring. So let me, uh, let me start with uh, Coach, coach uh, uh, Romar. Thanks for coming. Glad that you're here. Looking forward to hearing more about not only this coming season on the basketball court, but this coming season in our country's battle for racial justice. And so we'll talk a little bit about that toward the end, but uh, let me just start off by, by uh, asking you kind of where you're from, where you grew up, what was life like for, for Lorenzo? Well, I grew up about uh, 50, five, zero minutes from the campus in, in a place called Compton. And uh, that, that was home. We had a lot of uh, uh, athletes there. A lot of people were successful from the neighborhood I, I, uh, I came up in. And uh, just had a great like? time. Wouldn't, pardon? What was your family like? Uh, mother and father, brother. That was our family. Mother and father both worked, worked a lot. <laughs> worked, worked quite a bit. And when did you when did you start uh, down the athletic route? And what sports did you play initially? Initially, uh, baseball was my first uh, sport. But uh, as I began to play baseball, I was probably about eight years old, just messing around. But then uh, picked up a ball when I was ten years old and put it up to the rim, and it went in, and uh, I was hooked after that. And there it went after that, just. Good thing the first one went in, huh? Good thing first the first one went, one went in, in, from what I remember. It was about a six-inch shot, but it went in. And how were, <laughs> how were you size-wise uh, relative to your, your classmates? Were you a big kid, little kid? I was 5'1 in the eighth grade. In the ninth grade, I was 5'3", five, 5'6 five, and a half. In the 10th grade, 5'11". In the 11th, 6'1 as a senior. I remember those because I had the little markers on the wall because I wanted desperately to be able to grow. Okay, and how old, how tall did you ultimately get to be? Six foot two. Six two. Yeah. Six so so tell two. us about uh, your high school college, your high school basketball career and how that ended up uh, landing you at University of Washington. I'll tell you what, uh, as a 10th grader, I was at a school, it was a basketball powerhouse called Verbum Day High School in South Central uh, Los Angeles, and uh, I remember going out for the varsity and getting cut within two hours, and then the next day going out for the junior varsity and getting cut there within two hours. It just was tough. I was five, six and a half. I went on, to transferred. My, my family moved to another part of Compton. I transferred to another high school, Pius X, made that team but wasn't a starter, and uh, eventually went to Cerritos Junior College. There was no other options for me, and as a sophomore, I began to get better, began to develop, and University of Washington saw me and offered me a basketball scholarship, and that's how I got there. Okay, so tell us about your time at UW. Uh, was it a, a formative experience? You, know, you, you later came back as a coach that we'll get to, but uh, tell us about your time at UW. Great time. I was first time out on my own. I learned a lot, uh, made a lot of mistakes while I was in college, just trying trying to learn life. I uh, didn't have a stellar basketball career though. I think my first year from junior college, I averaged 6.4 points a game. And my senior year, I averaged 9.4 points a game. Didn't exactly set the uh, world on fire that, in that regard. And yet, and yet, the NBA came calling. Tell us about that. How did that happen from someone who wasn't a prolific scorer? I was uh, fortunate enough to, to be drafted. Uh, there was a man named Pete Newell who was uh, one of the all-time greatest coaches ever in our game. And he was a scout, the head scout for the Golden State Warriors. Well, he actually was also uh, doing the Monday night Pac-10 game of the week. Uh, it was televised. And so he saw me play. And he told the Warrior people, he says, if you have a chance in the late rounds, there were 10 rounds back then, thank goodness, in the NBA draft. He says, if you have a chance in the late rounds, you might want to take a look at this kid. I just... I think he works hard. I think he loves the game. There's something about him that he enjoys himself, and I think he could possibly be a player. So with the 141st player picked, I was that guy in the seventh round of the 1980 draft and uh, just struggled 
struggled because I didn't know what was going to happen. There were 22 players in camp the first day, and the day before the final cut, there were 14, and I was still one of those guys, and I eventually worked my way in to make the team. And I remember thinking my coach when he told me you had made the team. His name was Al Adels, and I said, Coach, thank you. He stopped me. He said, don't thank me. He said, we had a ticket ready for you to go. We were going to cut you many times, but you just kept working. You kept working. So just remember to stay in this league. You're going to have to continue to do what you were doing to get here. Well, obviously you continued to work like you, like you had to get on the team because you stayed in the league for five years. Tell us about what life was like as an NBA player. And before you answer, let me remind everybody to, to look at the chat box below and add whatever questions you have. We're going to save some time for Coach Romar uh, from the, uh, for questions from the audience. So what was it like uh, in, in the N NBA, uh, Lorenzo? Well, uh, it was obviously my wildest dream coming true. You know, you're, you're watching – you're down there warming up, and on the other end, you see Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is warming up. You're you're at the free throw line, uh, someone shooting the free throw, and you're lined up, and you feel the guy's arm next to you is Julius Irving, Dr. J. You know, all of these guys that I just, you know, you, you grow up watching them play, and now you're actually on the same floor with them. So you're playing in the old Boston Garden. You're playing in Madison Square Garden. All of these places that uh, you just thought – you know, if I could ever do this, you know, it, it would be fantastic. So those were great times. But then the reality of it wasn't as good sometimes because the players were so good. You know, it, it was just – you. So I remember a couple of times being up 20, beating a team by 20, and the coaches clearing the bench my rookie year. And I'm in there and I'm thinking, okay, I, I won't have to play against their best. I won't have to play against a, a Pete Maravich. I won't have to play against somebody like that because they're out of the game. The guy, the 12th man off the bench was just as good as some of the guys that were playing. So it was, it was, it, but it was a fun time, obviously a very pivotal, pivotal time in my life. One I'll never forget. And when, when was it that you decided that uh, you wanted to continue in basketball after you were done playing in the NBA as a coach? How did that come about? I was invited to the Indiana Pacers camp. I was with them in the summer league, and they told me they thought I would make their team the following year uh, as a backup point guard. And that was in 1985. Uh, it wasn't a guaranteed situation. And at that point, we had, our, uh, we had just had our first child, uh, just been married for about a, a year and a half, and just wasn't in the league and didn't want to – risk that. I had become a Christian the year before. Mm -hmm. And Athletes in Action approached me, who was a Christian-based uh, arm uh, athletic branch of Campus Crusade for Christ, would take the team around the country and around the world and use basketball as a platform to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I was thinking at the time, you know, I can go use this game and tell thousands about the Lord, how he can change their lives. And that's when I took advantage of it and left to join Athletes in Action and was with them for seven years. And in the last three became a player coach. And at that point is kind of when I started to feel like maybe coaching would be something that I'd want to do. Hmm. Well, you mentioned your, your, uh, your conversion to, uh, to faith in Christ. Tell us a little bit about that. How did that come about? Well, I, I was one that uh, always felt that the more good deeds that I did, the better person is, that I could be would give me a, a, a chance to get to heaven one day. Never thought that there was any way that I could get there for sure. It was be the best that I could, and then we'll see what happens. That was kind of my attitude. So I would kind of keep track. I try to do good deeds. I try to go to church. I try to uh, – do good things for people, and I just looked at it as works. The better person I can be, the better chance I'll get there. That was until I read the scriptures for the first time. That was in 1983. I read them for the first time and realized that no matter how good I tried to be, I would always fall short of God's standard that he would have for me. God knew that. God made arrangements for me to meet his standard. That was through his son, Jesus Christ. I read that the Bible said I was born a sinner and that the penalty for that sin would be eternal separation. 
I wouldn't be with the Lord. And But if I accepted Jesus Christ, that all would be forgiven through Christ, and I would then become a child of God. And I read that, read that Jesus rose from the dead and that he was still alive, and that's how I became a Christian along with my wife on the same day. Wow, fantastic. So then you, you played for Athletes in Action, you started coaching with them, and then UCLA. Tell us about uh, what it was like to be an assistant coach for Jim Herrick when you guys won the national championship. Understand now, I told you I grew up in Compton, so that means I was seven years old. I was uh, five years old in uh, 65 when they won it, uh, and on and on and on when then Lou Alcindor played at UCLA and Bill Walton played at UCLA and they were just winning almost every game. I was watching every game and you just didn't want them to ever lose. And now I remember having a key to Pauley Pavilion where they played those games, being able to go into that facility whenever I wanted to. It was, it was very surreal for me. And then you're there, the tradition is there. You see the banners there, you rub shoulders with the past legends there, you, you're able to go to John Wooden's house and hang out with him for hours at a time. And it was just a phenomenal experience. And I learned so much uh, about coaching from Jim Herrick, who was the, the first leader that I had in, the, in this Division I coaching experience. Now, did he have any impact on, because uh, he had been at Pepperdine prior to UCLA, did he have any impact on you then making the jump from UCLA to Pepperdine? You know, a, a little. He would always tell me about what it was like to work for Pepperdine, but I, I, I'm going to try not to be long-winded on this answer, but when I was, I think I was uh, 14 years old, a good friend of ours who was a student at Pepperdine drove us up to Malibu on the campus and the gym was just being built. Firestone Fieldhouse was just being built. In fact, there was a lot of plastic everywhere and the floor had just been put down. It wasn't even open yet. I don't even think the windows were up yet. And uh, after that, I remember following Pepperdine, coming to Pepperdine games when uh, they had good teams and when Dennis Johnson played and Gary Colson was the coach. So there was a lot of familiarity with Pepperdine. And not to mention all that, uh, when I, on my drive home, when I was an assistant at UCLA, to get off on Las Virginies, where we lived in Calabasas, it always said Pepperdine, next mm -hmm. right. So there was a constant reminder about Pepperdine was right there. And there was an arrow pointing toward uh, your, your next place. How did that come about? How did you end up getting hired? Did you apply? Were you approached? I actually uh, was approached the first time, I believe it was in 95, going into the 95 season. And I thought our team at UCLA was going to be pretty good. And I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity but I would hate to leave and then we end up going to the final four and I wouldn't experience something like that. So I decided not to go and sure enough, we won the entire thing, not just the final four, we won a national championship. And it was shortly thereafter, about a year later, where the job was open again. And at this point, uh, I was contacted again uh, and decided uh, this is what I wanted to do, uh, go to coach at Pepperdine. Well, your three years at Pepperdine went from a rebuilding year to two strong years, which then led to a, a, a short stay at, uh, at uh, St. Louis as you moved toward going home to, to your alma mater, uh, where you coached for a decade and a half. Tell us about how it came that you, you ended up going to, to be the head coach at University of Washington. I got a call from the athletic director at Barbara Hedges then from the University of Washington and she asked about my interest, uh, and I said I'd be very interested. When I first got into coaching, you think about, okay, where would you like to end up at one day? And I thought if some kind of way I could end up being the head coach at Washington, my alma mater, that would, that would be fantastic. I remember Marv Harshman, whom I played for, who was uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame, NBC Hall of Fame, Naismith Hall of Fame. I thought if I could accomplish some of the things he did it would it would be great and the issue is I was the fourth choice though and there were several that had to turn the job down before it was offered to me but it was finally I got a call on a Sunday evening and uh, she said uh, the athletic director are you ready to become the head coach 
the University of Washington. I said, absolutely. And <laughs> there it went and went on to Washington and um, it, it was a great experience. Yeah, well, you had quite a bit of success there, multiple Sweet 16s and uh, even a Final Four and a number one seed. And, and eventually fate brought you back to Pepperdine. That's to our benefit. We're glad to have you back. You were at University of Arizona uh, immediately before coming back to Pepperdine. Tell us about uh, how and, and why you ended up rejoining Pepperdine as, as, as for round two as our head coach a few years back. As an assistant at Arizona, I was, I enjoyed where I was. I was learning a lot, even though myself as a head coach and Sean Miller was the head coach at Arizona, had competed, teams had competed against each other. Uh, I, I still was learning a lot from him. And I began to think if I were to get a uh, opportunity to become a head coach again, I would want to go somewhere where there was familiarity. I would not want to learn, have to relearn all of the different coaches in the area, whether their high school or AAU coaches. I wanted to be familiar with the territory. I wanted to go somewhere that had a chance to be successful. And I wanted to go somewhere where it was close to where I grew up uh, on the West Coast, but even closer to where I grew up. And Pepperdine met all of that criteria. So when given the opportunity to come back, I was uh, elated. Well, we're thrilled to have you. And in, in watching uh, the games, particularly this last year, uh, was, there was a lot of, uh, of heart palpitations, blood pressure, a lot of comeback wins, a lot of, uh, of uh, well, not a lot, but a, a few disappointing losses. But um, tell us what this season looks like. This, let's, let's, let's first look back on the last season. What were kind of the, what were the high points and what were the low points of this last season? Well, uh, sometimes during the game there were high points. And then at the end of the game it was a low point. You know, we're not talking about moral victories, but, you know, against Arizona, we lose almost at the buzzer. Mm -hmm. Against Gonzaga a couple of times, the game came down to – at Gonzaga came down to, you know, the last shot of the game, and they were number one in the country. You know, we had some really good opportunities to, uh, to do some special things, and I think we made improvements, but we were so close to, to taking the next step. And I think overall, when you talk about a – a high point was to see our progress and to see even though our record didn't indicate it, our program was at a point now where we were able to compete with just about anyone. I didn't say beat anyone, but compete and look like we belonged, which is something, you know, we want to piggyback on and, and use as a springboard for this coming year. You know, I, I would say the, the low point of the of the season was, was probably the injuries. You talk about someone like a Andre Ball, Jody Smith, those guys were uh, rotation guys or even starters. Those guys would have contributed to our team. But to not be able to go out with the full complement of players uh, was probably a low point, one that we had to make adjustments to, and, and I think we did. Yeah, and losing, losing Keith for part of the season, losing Jan for the, for the second half of the season. It just seemed like uh, one or two players away from having the kind of season we hope for. What does next season look like to you? Well, I, I've been saying lately, as I've been asked that question, in, at the highest levels, when you are experienced, that's how you have more of a chance to be successful. When you're young, when you get to the higher levels, it's, it's just tough. You look at young teams, they just don't quite know how to pull out the close games. They just don't quite know how to get it done. But the experience that, uh, that shows out on the floor when teams are older, I think, prevails. The first couple of years we were here, we didn't have that. But now we do. Going into this year, we have an experienced group of guys. We've got a a complement of juniors and seniors that have been through the battles, been battle tested. So we have that experience now. Uh, but you also, when you have experience and you have talent, that makes it even better. And we talk about a guy like Colby Ross, who is just gold, period. But in the college game, when you have a lead guard, a point guard that is as good a basketball player as he is, that's a senior, it's something that gives you a chance to really be successful. A kid like Kessler Edwards, who has been learning and getting better, who is now going to be a junior and is now an upperclassman and one of the leaders of this team, is going to be a better basketball player. When you have guys like that going into your year, 
with the other kids that are will complement those guys, and and a couple of them will step up and mm-hmm. play at a high high level. When that happens, it gives you reason to to be optimistic. Our staff has been intact. We've had the same staff now going into three years. I think there's a lot of cohesiveness and a lot of familiarity with our concepts, our philosophy, with everyone, with players and the coaches, the trainers, everyone. So uh, we, we are cautiously optimistic about this upcoming season. Well, you mentioned Colby Ross. You meant, you know, Colby, for those uh, in the audience who, who know Colby and his, his time on the court, to, to, to break the all-time assist record for the university in his junior year to be poised within the first handful of games in his senior year to break the all-time scoring record for the university, to have someone who does know what it's like to hit a last second shot to win a game, who, who can inspire his teammate and roar uh, and, uh, you know, get the crowd roaring. Tell us what, tell us what it's like to have somebody of his, his talent, his tenacity, his work ethic leading a team. Well, it's, it's invaluable. It, it's, it's not something that uh, you totally teach him. You help him along the way, but that, that type of thing is who he is. Wherever he is, that's what he's going to bring to the table. And he gives you a, a sense of know-how. He gives you a sense of, of pride. And you can't help but follow his lead because he's such a hard, hard worker. And he demands a lot from his teammates he won't accept mediocrity from himself or his teammates or from anyone. And you can just see that uh, he goes out and plays with a, with a chip on his shoulder. Uh, he has been overlooked. He feels Pepperdine has been overlooked. And he, he wants to be a part of Pepperdine's legacy. Uh, Jim, we had Doug Christie speak to our team on a Zoom chat. And he talked about how when he was at Pepperdine, how they dominated the league for three years. and. Uh, what it looked like, what it looked like on a daily basis. And you could just see Kobe is just longing for our situation to be like that in his senior year. So what he brings to the table is just something that's going to be very, very difficult to replace. But while you have it, you take full advantage of it and enjoy the time that, uh, that he's here. Amen. For those of you who don't know who Doug Christie is, Doug was a, a star player here at Pepperdine when I was a student. I used to come and watch him play, Then he played for about a decade in the NBA. And uh, what I remember about Doug was when I was a student, we had intramurals. Whenever I was down there playing intramural basketball, he was over on the side shooting. The guy just was never not in the gym. Then a year ago, I had foot surgery and wasn't able to do any running, so I just came in the morning at about 5.30 every morning and shot. And there was Colby on the other end of the the court in the morning, had that ball machine. And that ball machine, when the ball goes in the hoop, it shoots it back to you. And Colby just, you know, we just net, 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 wherever he went and and just continually uh, driving toward perfection. And so it's gonna be great to watch. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what what you see in in the future on another, in another season. So when, when we had this most recent uh, civil unrest in the United States and this, this act, these acts that we've seen of, of injustice, uh, you, you uh, didn't take the, the, the easiest path that some of, the, some of your fellow coaches around college basketball, not casting aspersions, but just to say, you, didn't, you decided not to be silent and you, you, um, you got involved. Tell us a little bit about what what caused you to, um, to enter this dialogue and, and how you went about doing this and where you see things going? I got to ask you, do I have 30 seconds, two minutes to answer this? You, you've, got, you've got as much time as you want. Take three or four minutes if you want it. When I was uh, six years old, my father uh, called, called me and my brother over and to the side of the house outside, there was a little stairwell where you could climb up and almost get to the roof of our house. And he says, I want you to come look at something. And we climbed up the stairs and we saw flames. We saw buildings burning down. It was the 1965 Watts riots. And uh, this, at this point, this wasn't anything on television. This was right there. We could see the actual flames. That prompted me to watch the news, to watch and see the actual 
things we saw in person were actually being talked about on the news. And that's a big deal when you're six years old. And I didn't totally understand it, but I knew it had some racial overtones and uh, you went on. I didn't experience racism personally uh, toward me until I was about 12 or 13 years old, where uh, I was kind of, uh, no one physically uh, harmed me, but names were called, I was being threatened. And this was within a baseball team where I was only the only black kid on the team. And, you know, I practiced a couple of days with those kids and everything seemed fine. But when there was some controversy, when there was adversity, then, uh, then the names were being called and I, I left, I walked away. I didn't know how to handle it. And then it, there wasn't as much, you know, you'd get names called because of the color of your skin, but you, I, I've been to, I, I was start to sense that there was some situations where certain people would judge me and treat me like I had a handicap and they didn't even know me, but based on the color of my skin, I just maybe wasn't quite good enough. And uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but it kind of messed with my self-esteem a little bit at times. On the basketball floor, there were, there were no uh, deficiencies. I was always treated equally, but away from that basketball floor, certain situations, I would be somewhat intimidated because I just felt like people were looking at me that way because I was told that at times. But you just keep moving and I just felt like, just keep working hard, just keep working hard and, and things will be fine. And uh, I became a Christian. When, I, when that happened, I realized then, which was great, that no amount of racism or discrimination was gonna keep me from experiencing whatever God had planned for me. That was very liberating for me. But it was still there. You could tell racism was still there. You're still treated the same way. In the last decade, crimes, killings began getting recorded, and you can actually see those things. These were things that had been going on for years. You just heard about them, but you didn't get to see them totally in person. But even then, uh, you're, you're still kind of silent. You talk about it amongst your peers, how this is messed up, things have to change. But if you were ever to, if you were to speak out publicly, you felt you were looked upon as a militant or a troublemaker. So you just adapted the way of, uh, that's the way of life. We just got to have to deal with it. When it finally happened with George Floyd, and I watched the officer's knee on his neck and callously murder someone and then walk away afterwards and you didn't hear of an arrest or anything, it triggered something in me that all of these years, it had bothered me, but I just kind of suppressed my feelings and, and, and tried to block it out. Well, it all came out and I became very emotional. I just, it just can't happen. This is not right. And that is when I decided that I was gonna speak out more against it because this isn't headed the right way. It's it's getting worse. It's not getting better. Yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, you know being on a team. When you're on a team together, none of that matters because you have a goal. You're working together towards something. Your brothers, your brothers and sisters, your 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 teammates, and and uh, it seems like we're missing that as a society right now. Having that that sense of, of we're all on the same team. Let's just stop. Let's stop with this looking at somebody differently or treating them differently because of the color of their skin or their gender or whatever. And just to, to hear your experience of, man, if, we, if we're just on the same team, if we, if we would just recognize we were on the same team, then, then this would be a whole lot easier and a whole lot more uh, fair and just. And, and anything you want to add? I was going to say, it's been encouraging to see, you know, the watch riots, the white riots, Rodney King, the things that happened in, in Ferguson, in the Midwest, usually the things, the protests are going on in the inner cities. And this time it just seems like uh, all ethnicities and different people are coming together to fight for the same thing. And just, just equality, that's all it is. No one is fighting to be better than the other. It's just God created us all equally and we can all uh, stand up just for equality, and that's how I see it. So it's encouraging to see that uh, many people are coming together fighting for the same thing now, more than I've ever seen before.
Yeah, amen, amen. It's great to have you on our team here at Pepperdine, Lorenzo. Let me right. turn it over to Keith and let him uh, ask some of the questions we're getting in from the audience. Hello, Coach. Thank you, President Gash. And uh, Coach, great to have you with us and uh, really appreciate your transparency and candor. Uh, Jim's asking a few questions about the season. Uh, uh, I'll ask you, uh, will there be a season? And what are some of the things that you are having to think through as uh, you try to make sure you can actually play and, and hopefully even play in front of spectators? Well, we're hopeful that there's going to be a season, but you know, we also want to be safe too. And we have to be smart about it. And uh, you know, there are plans to phase uh, the students back in. There, there are plans to phase the student athletes back in. Even when our student athletes return, uh, it won't just be an all out practice situation where you just go out five on five. There are still measures that need to be taken for safety. Testing will take place uh, before anyone can do anything, even when they return. So, Hopefully, doing the right things, practicing safety, following instructions will allow us to get back uh, sooner than later. And, you know, I've seen situations where uh, games are played and you have people uh, in, in the stands with masks, but that may be the case also where uh, only a certain select few will be able to attend games. We're just not sure. I'm definitely not the expert on it, but uh, we're, we're just going to try to do uh, the right thing do what we're asked to do to make sure safety first, but we would love to be able to go out and do the thing we love to do, coach, and play this game. Amen. We look forward to seeing you on the court. Uh, another question is, tell us a little bit, what, what do you hope your legacy will be, at, you know, at Pepperdine in this, in this particular chapter? Uh, whether it would 10 years, 20 years, whatever, is that uh, Pepperdine had a coach they had this basketball coach that uh, played a big part in changing a lot of people's lives. And if that is what comes out of people's mouth first, then I would say, all right, I'm with that one. I like that one. Excellent. Uh, to talk a little bit about, again, we're, we're in a, a moment of, of evaluation here in, in American culture around race. And uh, one of the questions is, you know, how have you been able to visit with the team you know, how have you gone about interacting and, and talking with the team about this and give us a sense of, uh, of, of how that has gone and, and where the team is uh, mentally in, in relation to all the, the challenges we're experiencing? I think we have a pretty good close relationship with all of our guys. And uh, one of the first things we did, I know for me as the head coach of this basketball program, it took a while. I mentioned earlier about how it's triggered something in me with, with all of this going on. And you're already dealing with the pandemic that was going on. And then this comes along and it took me a little while to process it, maybe about a week to tell you the truth. And then we met with our team and we talked to our team about it. I, I shared, you know, my experience with it. We, we had a police officer come in and talk to, to our group. Uh, we, we just had, tried to create an open dialogue. And then, you know, we talked to our guys individually, a few of them, uh, the ones that we thought might be struggling with it even more. So we talked to them on an individual basis and tried to encourage them to, to speak their mind if they felt that it was something that they needed to say. They didn't have to run from it. They didn't have to be silent. And uh, those are some of the things that we did. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, great learning opportunities for, for, for you as a coach and a mentor to, to, the, to, the, to the guys. Uh, what, what, what is your most memorable game? Can you think of one game as a coach or a player that just kind of uh, sticks out uh, as you think about your career? Oh, boy. Uh, player would, would have to be uh, coming back on opening day when I was playing for the Warriors, playing against the Los Angeles Lakers, they had just won a world championship the year before. And on opening night, they were having the ring ceremony to give out the rings from the year before and just happened to be the night that we were playing them. And, you know, Kareem, uh, Magic, all those guys were playing for them, them, James Worthy, and uh, we beat them that night. And uh, I had a pretty good game, and that was a – that was a great memory. As a coach, uh, 
it might have been uh, at St. Louis. Uh, St. Louis hadn't had a lot of success, had not won a league championship or conference tournament championship. And Kenyon Martin was a guy that ended up playing in the NBA, but he was playing for Cincinnati at the time. And he was a college player of the year, the number one pick in the draft. And he was really, really good. And they were number one in the country, and we upset them in the conference tournament and went on to win that tournament. That was a, that was a huge game for us. And uh, also probably the games that we won to ensure that we won the league when I was at the University of Washington, uh, which hadn't been done in, in 53 years. And then at Pepperdine, the last time we were here, we had a pretty good win at Gonzaga, uh, where we won at the buzzer there. So there have been some fun times over the years. Yeah, great memories, and uh, it was it's uh, it's it's. I remember when we beat Gonzaga regularly. A lot of comments. We've got a few apparently uh, recruit uh, play, kids that want to come play for you, but we'll pass those along uh, to the proper NCAA uh, uh, regulate uh, rules. But just you know, what advice do you have? One question is, what advice do you have for for teenagers that really want to play even D one basketball? You know, what advice or encouragement might you offer? You're only going to be as good as, as they say, put your money where your mouth is. You really want to be a player? You want to play D1? Uh, number one, you've got to do well enough in school so that you're a qualifier, so that you can gain entrance uh, into a university. Um, that's going to be extremely important. But then you've got to play. You've got to, you, you can't be unrealistic and think just because I go play and shoot around for an hour every now and then I'm going to play college basketball. You've got to put the time into it. And you have to have some goals. And you can't let anything get in the way of those goals. Uh, video games, uh, whatever, whatever you have going for you that's going to get in the way, other than, you know, to me, God and family, whatever, anything else, it just can't come before your academics and your your – your athletics, if you want to be a big time player and reach those goals. Great advice. And uh, let me offer this as maybe the last question. Um, in general, there's a lot of comments too, though, just about not only appreciation uh, for how you coach, but uh, appreciation for how you model an example uh, for not only the men on your team, but just the, the university um, uh, values in particular. This question is really about recruiting. You know, you're known as one of the best recruiters in the country. Tell us a little bit about uh, how you go about recruiting. Is that still something you primarily do, or do you delegate it to to, to one or more of your coaches? Tell them uh, without sharing uh, secrets that that others can take. Uh, tell us a little about it, what's made you such a great recruiter over the years. Well, that's that's nice to say. Uh, I'll tell you, I've, I've worked at some places that are pretty easy to recruit to, to tell you the truth. That helps. I think I've been able to identify and surround myself with a staff of uh, guys that really know what they're doing and are, are people persons that they, they know how to identify talent. Uh, they have taken the time to learn what I want as a head coach, which is half the battle. And they're guys that I really trust and are very loyal. I think that's very, very important. Uh, I don't have this great formula. I just think that the scriptures tell us how to live a certain way. Uh, it's not just a how to live in church, how to conduct yourself in church. It's how to conduct yourself in any area of your life. And I think it applies to recruiting. I think when people are treated the way that they want to be treated, that you would want to be treated, you treat them that way then people respond to that. When people know that you really, really care, they sense that, they don't sense that you're being phony. I think that helps. And then ultimately, can you gain someone's trust? And that's hard to do. Uh, you know, you go out to buy a car, two different lots, one on each side of the street, one car is at a higher level, the other's at a lower level, but you trust the salesman at the lower level car, you may get the lower level car just because you trust that person. And we just, I, I think relationships and gaining that trust is, is huge. Um, more than necessarily what, what you're selling. 
Amen. Turn Thank back you. Over to Jim. Thank you, Lorenzo. Let, let me just answer a couple of the questions that are there, just in terms of when is Pepperdine going to get an arena worthy of its aspirations of, of Division One greatness? And Great we, question, right? <laughs> as soon as possible. We, we, have, uh, we have plans, we have architectural drawings, we have um, Coastal Commission approvals for, for part of what we need, but uh, the answer is with all deliberate speed. It's going to take several years, but it is something that we have decided we're going to do. Uh, we'll be going through a fundraising campaign in a few years to make sure that gets done, but the answer is uh, hopefully uh, it'll, be, it'll be the place that Lorenzo uh, presides over for quite some time. It just won't be, it won't be right away, but it's coming. Trust me, it's coming. Great. We look forward to, to uh, having that be an important part of campus. Uh, the Firestone Fieldhouse has served us quite well over the years. It's time for the next uh, generation of, uh, of uh, players to play at uh, an arena that um, shows how serious we are about excellence in everything that we do. One of the reasons uh, we hired you, Lorenzo, is because we, we do strive for excellence. And I think everybody here now is absolutely clear as to wh why you're the right person to lead us at this time. And uh, we look forward to a great season ahead. Any last words, Lorenzo? Uh, I don't think so. You, you, have, you guys have asked some great, great questions. Uh, great job putting this together. I just would like to say that uh, Pepperdine is the place that uh, whenever I coach my last game, this is where I want it to be. I've got a lot of pride in this university, and I want us to be successful. And I just thank everyone that has come along and tried to be a part of uh, helping us uh, become a greater place, greater program. And lastly, when you talk about race relations, I am so proud of where I work for, working for Jim Gash and our athletic director, Steve Potts, and the administration and the work that they are already trying to do to, uh, to show that Pepperdine wants to play its part in uh, making things all equal. I really appreciate that. Well, thank you, Lorenzo. I look forward to growing old with you here in Malibu. As, uh, as, as we, we try to write together the next chapter of Pepperdine basketball and Pepperdine's uh, leadership in higher education. God bless you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We'll see you next time. Be looking for the email for the next announcement for the next installment of Coffee with Jim. Thanks, Lorenzo. Thank you. Thanks for having me.